continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today once again is a leading constitutional lawyer who has appeared on this program so many times I really feel he shares it with me. Floyd Abrams is a partner in the prestigious law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell. He is known far and wide for his devotion to free speech, First Amendment, causes. And this program is frequently known for its kind of button-down aspect. Today it won't be buttoned down because last time when I was doing a program with Mr. Abrams, uh, which incidentally was on, uh, based on an editorial which appeared in the New York Times not so long ago called McCain-Feingold Goes to Court, referring not itself but indirectly to the fact that Floyd Abrams um, I've never known as uh, associated with many right-wingers, is now associated with Kenneth Starr and with the uh, National Rifle Association and a good many other people who are fighting what liberals, and Floyd Abrams is a liberal, have generally wanted, and that is campaign finance reform. Well, we talk so much last time that I knew that I hadn't asked Floyd a number of the questions uh, that I needed to ask, and I asked him to stay here, and that's why this is so informal. Floyd, thanks for staying with me. Uh, I think maybe I wanted you to stay so that I could catch you on some points, because I certainly didn't catch you on any, and maybe it's because I'm so impressed with your devotion to First Amendment causes and your strong feeling that the uh, McCain bill in the Senate, as it has passed the Senate and the House, doesn't meet your constitutional standards and you're going to try to convince the Supreme Court that it doesn't. How likely is it that when the court renders its decision, it will be in favor of you and your right-wing friends? <laughs> uh, well, first, uh, as, as I said in our last uh, engagement, amongst my not-so-right-wing friends on this case are the American Civil Liberties Union and AFL, CIO, and some other groups. Um, we'll forgive but, them, but I don't know about I understand. you, Floyd. I understand. They can go about their lives. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, on that part of the bill, which uh, essentially directly bars speech, uh, relating to issues, what my opponents in this case call sham issue ads, or what they call counterfeit issue ads, and what I call issue ads. Uh, I think in terms of where the law is now, we would almost certainly win. I think there the question is, will the Supreme Court change what it has said in the past in the direction of, of those people who uh, think uh, we've had too much speech or too much money or whatever you want to call it uh, in this area. Uh, but I feel pretty confident about that. The soft money issue, uh, in a way, is harder uh, because the restraint is not, an, uh, not a direct restraint on speech. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's not saying you can't say that, which is what the issue ad part of the law says. It's saying you can't spend uh, all sorts of money you used to be able to spend, uh, even if it's used for speech-related purposes. Isn't that the heart of the bill? 
I don't know. I, I don't think you can really separate the, the two provisions. Uh, the bill passed in good part because 50 percent of soft money is now being spent on issue ads. So the, the proponents of the bill wanted very much to end soft money, as it's called, and to end uh, what they believe to be phony issue ads. Um, um, I think on the soft money issue, that one of the central issues will be what is the likely impact on the political party system that we have now. Uh, that is to say, is the impact of saying that the Democratic National Committee, the Republican National Committee, can no longer get uh, 40, 45 percent of its funding at all going to be, and that that money can go elsewhere to other, other sorts of groups that, that will take positions, especially if we win on the issue ad part of the case. Um, is that consistent with, with really uh, the structure of our government as the we've had it? The two-party system. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, in a lot of cases, the, the Supreme Court has been very protective of the two-party system um, and very protective of the parties, um, even against certain third-party activities or outsider influence uh, and the like. Um, but I think that the, uh, the argument against the, the flat ban on uh, uh, contributions in this area uh, is a very strong one. And uh, uh, while it, it may turn out that that may not be the part of the case that I'm arguing, uh, it, uh, it raises very serious uh, and troubling First Amendment issues. Are there any indications that party leadership, both major parties, uh, are questioning their own stands now? The Republicans are basically against this bill, and certainly the Republican leadership. Um, um, it passed because there were a, enough Democratic votes and a number of and enough breakaway Republican votes to lead to a 60 to 40 vote. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the Senate to prevent a filibuster, right? But but the, but that was the vote. It was what right. uh, was sixty to forty? Um, um, certainly, the Republican leadership was against this bill, um, and uh, the president was against it. Uh, the president signed it, but uh, he was certainly not uh, happy with it, and I think he's made clear that uh, in the campaign he said he would veto it. Uh, uh, he's made clear that he's, he certainly thinks that there are significant elements of it which are constitutionally uh, dubious or uh, troublesome. <coughs> the Democratic leadership uh, certainly is for the bill. Uh, this was a major victory for them as well as Senator McCain. Uh, I hear from some of them privately that they're not so sure. I, I don't mean everyone by any means, and certainly not Senator McCain. Um, uh, I think one of the realities is that people are not so sure who it's going to help or not. Uh, and, and while the general assumption was any, anything that allows more money to be spent is good for Republicans, that's, that's not always true. It really is a more sophisticated matter in political terms, uh, because as I said last time, uh, Democrats do better with large gifts from individuals. Republicans do much better with $2,000 gifts from many more people. Democrats do better with union gifts, Republicans with corporate gifts, you know. So I, I don't think people know that well how it's going to play. Uh, uh, as we meet today, uh, we're about 10 days away from the end of the time period in which new parties, new, new people can come in in this lawsuit. And I'm still hopeful that, uh, that we will get some Democratic uh, uh, participation. Indeed, the, the, uh, 
Washington Times reported uh, just uh, a few days ago that it seemed likely that the California Democratic Party and the California Republican Party were both going to bring a lawsuit together, j joining ours, uh, challenging the constitutionality uh, of the bill. And, and I'm hopeful we'll have some more Democratic support. We spoke about public finance briefly on our previous program. Without any regard for anything else that we've said, would you be for public finance of presidential, congressional races, at least presidential? Yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly be in favor of significantly more in the way of public financing of, uh, uh, of elections w without cutting back on you know, someone else's ability to say no to public financing or whatever restrictions uh, it involves, uh, as President Bush did last time. I mean, my, my view, for example, I, I think of the New York City election uh, that, that, that we had here not so long ago, where, where uh, Mr. Bloomberg, now Mayor Bloomberg, spent over $70 million of his own money uh, under Supreme Court case law. Uh, he's allowed to spend, anyone's allowed to spend any amount of your own money. The theory of that is that you can't corrupt yourself, and you don't appear to have corrupted yourself either. If it's your money. Um, um, and the Democratic candidate, Mark Green, spent, I think, in the order of $18 million, which together with the Democratic nomination uh, made the race just about even. Um, um, I mean, I wish that that balance had been a little bit closer. I don't think it has to be even or anything like even. And I do think that people funding their own complaint and bringing in new money uh, without which you just can't run a campaign uh, is more useful than not in the democratic process. I think we've been well served by having new blood and new parties. I mean, I think when Stuart Mott put a lot of money up for Gene McCarthy in 1968, uh, without which he would not have been able to really get going on his campaign, uh, the public was served. I'm intrigued by what you said last time in particular, that perhaps the answer to much of this, and I don't pretend that I think to all of it, is prosecution of the laws on the books. If money is given in return for uh, favors, <clears throat> prosecute. Right, if it's real favors. Now, uh, as you pointed out to me then, that's not easy to prove. Mm -hmm. um, but if one really believes and can prove that, that large uh, donations result in a, you know, a change of vote or a vote that wouldn't have otherwise been there, uh, I mean, at some point we use the word bribery to describe uh, uh, somebody giving money to a political figure for a vote. Now, it gets close sometimes, obviously, and, and it's a delicate area because we want people to be able to communicate with their legislators. Uh, it's not bad that unions and corporations, you know, have their say and then some, but at some point there's always a risk of going over the line uh, and uh, uh, of actual corruption. Floyd, this matter of uh, money being speech, the equation of the two, What's your fix on it? Uh, that, that phrase in Buckley v. Vallejo uh, from 1976, um, I think, uh, carries with it what is an essential truth. It, it's also an oversimplification. Um, Justice Stevens, just uh, two years ago, taking issue with that, said money isn't speech, it's commerce. Well, the truth is, it's both. Sure, it's commerce. And sure, without it, you can't have speech. You can't buy ads on television. You can't buy billboards. You can't buy sound trucks. You can't, you can't get paid volunteers uh, in the, uh, on the ground. Uh, it is totally unrealistic to think one, that one can run a campaign for public office in America uh, without having a very significant a v and sometimes an enormous uh, pot of money 
to spend uh, on the campaign. And I don't believe anything is likely to change that. Uh, so on, on one level of uh, articulating it, yeah, money is, money is speech, money, uh, as I would, again, I think of it a little more negatively, without money, there's no speech. Um, but it still bothers you a little, doesn't it? Well, yeah, be, be, because uh, it, it's the trouble with all sort of catchwords. Uh, uh, money is speech and less than speech and more than speech. It, 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 it's a lot of different things. But, but the irreducible minimal truth of that phrase is that without significant amounts of money, one can't run for president uh, and indeed for more and more offices in America. And I don't see any way that that's going to be changed. I mean, if that's what the proponents really object to, if they look back to the days, and it wasn't many years ago, when in smaller states or really large states with few people, you could run a campaign for the United States Senate for less than a hundred thousand hmm. um, dollars, and now we're you know we're way up in the millions even in small states like that. Let alone you know when when Mike Huffington ran in California, I remember he spent twenty six million dollars and, and lost and lost and lost. Yeah, and it's worth saying that. You know, while money is indispensable uh, to run a campaign, it also doesn't win it for you. John Connolly ran a very expensive campaign, as, as you remember, to be nominated by the, Repu by the Republican Party so, some years ago and, and wound up with, what was it, three votes, four votes at the convention. Floyd, uh, the clock continues to tick and we don't have that much time. There was something last time that I wanted to ask you about. It had to do with this piece in the um, Sunday Magazine section of the New York Times called Fighting with the Right. The liberal First Amendment specialist ex explains his unlikely alliance with Kenneth W. Starr. We've done that to a fairly well. I was fascinated by the question to you, are you worried that the right of privacy this is not speech, but privacy, will suffer because of the war on terrorism. And you replied, privacy interests will yield to national security interests. Moreover, I'm afraid that I think that they should. And later you said, in answer to the question, are we talking now about 1984? I think there's a real risk. There's a risk of an endless war leading to terrible intrusions into civil liberties justified by the war itself. Now, this means you may be a free speech absolutist, but you're not a privacy absolutist, I, as I uh, read it. Well, that, that's true. I'm, I'm, I don't view myself as a free speech absolutist, even though there are some people who think I am. I mean, I, I, you know, I believe we ought to have libel law. I believe we ought to have uh, uh, some criminal law. Which, which can even directly punish people for what they say in very rare specified circumstances. Uh, I've never opposed having some obscenity law. Uh, I think it's more important to say that all those laws have to take account of and seriously take account of First Amendment interests. And so compared to the rest of the Western world, we have a, a weaker libel law. Because, okay. we, because we have a stronger First Amendment law. You, now, in, in the privacy yeah. area, uh, uh, I start with the fact that privacy isn't even in the Constitution. You have to tease it out. Uh, but your friends on the Supreme Court teased it out. Well, yeah, they, yeah, but in two ways. One, they teased it out in cases where the government's on the other side. And there I would do more teasing to okay. get it out. So in the abortion context or other contexts where the, where the government is coming to your door, uh, it seems to me that it is entirely appropriate to conclude that based on the whole thrust of the Bill of Rights and the whole structure uh, and, and music of the Bill of Rights, uh, that there is a privacy component. But when you start to talk about privacy 
vis-a-vis -vis pr other private rights, then, that then I get more trouble. Now, in this area of terrorism, you're talking about a governmental interest at its absolute height, the interest of protecting the public uh, against life-threatening activities. Uh, and yet, as I tried to say about uh, the or Orwellian vision, and yet we can see how easy it would be for this war against terrorism. Uh, assume we do everything in total good faith, no, no effort by political figures to misuse it. This can go on, the president has said, for 20 or 30 years easily. And then it's fair to ask, well, then how much do we have to give up in terms of uh, what have always been our civil liberties in order effectively to, to fight that, that, quote, war, unquote? And the answer to that well, question? Well, I, I mean, it's a very broad question, so it's, it's hard to answer in a sentence. Uh, my answer is that uh, I do believe that the attack on the uh, World Trade Center, and I do believe that the effort we're engaged in now um, uh, is one which is uh, properly viewed as transformative in American life. That is to say, we have to be prepared to give up more uh, in the way of what had been our, our openness as a society uh, and the degree to which we would simply say no to government inquiries or keep the government away from us in a lot of situations. I believe that that's so because we are, uh, we are at, uh, at great risk. Um, and I think uh, because of the risk, we have to be prepared uh, to make uh, significant concessions uh, towards being a, a less uh, private society. If we have cameras in the street, if we have uh, photographs being taken of us, I was passing by the White House a few times la last week, and there are cameras in Lafayette Park now. Um, is that a big deal? Yes, it is a big deal. Is it worth doing? I think it is. Uh, does it make me sad to think that, that we have to do it? Y yes, but my own balance is struck in the direction of saying that the risks are real enough and grave enough, given the, uh, the sort of people we are uh, fighting against uh, and certain particular characteristics of them, most particularly the combination of suicidal orientation and uh, ability to master modern technology, that, uh, that I think we have to be prepared to yield some of what made us so free and open uh, 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 from the, uh, that's the way we were. But that said, uh, you know, we can't just give it all up. I mean, we can't close down the shop. We can't give away all our civil liberties simply because of the genuineness and the reality of this threat. And I think that's going to be where a lot of the public policy battles uh, will and should be fought. And I don't know what side I'll be on of those, uh, because as I've said, I do think that this is by no means a feigned threat. I think it's very real and very serious. Um, and I think we're going to have to be willing to uh, uh, compromise. Has your involvement in the present suit uh, led you to feel differently about all of this, more intensely, less intensely? on one side or the other? Not about the privacy-like or terrorism-related issues, no. My involvement in this suit uh, has led me more uh, to think about uh, um, how hard it is for people to uh, seem to care about First Amendment interests when it's the other people exercising them. Example, I think one of the most troubling First Amendment cases in recent years is a case limiting abortion protests. A case in Colorado uh, in which the court basically upheld a Denver statute saying that if a woman is going to walk in a place, uh, a public health facility, a read abortion facility, uh, that 
No one can get within eight feet of her without her consent uh, uh, for obvious fear of, uh, you know, of intimidation. Um, and that was based in part on, on privacy, in good part on privacy. My reaction was that that, that was a terribly dangerous to, uh, ruling uh, which, which exalted privacy interests over free speech interests considerably. And in that case, I think that uh, Justice Scalia's dissenting opinion hit just the right note in expressing great alarm uh, at what the court was doing. Well, where were the liberal voices critical of that opinion? Where were the editorials? They were over on the privacy side. They were on the privacy side because they are concerned about women being intimidated when they want to have abortions. It's a perfectly understandable public policy concern. But they were not taking seriously, they were not weighing at all enough the seriousness of the First Amendment uh, price. Do you think it might not be unfair to say they were weighing them and came up differently than Floyd Abrams did? That's a, that's a very fair question. Uh, and, and I'll tell you the truth. Half the, minute. No, I don't think they were. <laughs> I, I, I really don't think that they, were, that they were seriously weighing them. I think they were reflexively doing what they thought the good thing was to do, which is to protect these women from bad speech. And a lot of what I think we have to do is to protect bad speech in order to protect good speech. Floyd Abrams, thanks again for joining me on The Open yeah. Mind. It's always a pleasure thanks. when you're here. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Production of the Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.